Welcome to another edition of the CalCorf TV show here on Daily World TV. This is episode number four. Folks, in the United States, there's a presidential election coming up in early November. Whoever wins it, whether it be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, they will be, of course, the next president of the United States. Polls indicate that the race is essentially tied. In fact, a new analysis done by Reuters, Ipsos, indicates that even the electoral college between the two candidates is now tied. Donald Trump has suddenly sprung into a lead in the electorally important state of Florida and has opened up a lead of several points, theoretically giving him the electoral votes from that state. Florida, of course, is a key state in any presidential election. You will remember in the year 2000, it was Al Gore losing the electoral vote in Florida that caused him to lose the presidency of the United States to George Bush, even though Bush had fewer popular votes than Gore did. Unfortunately, the United States still uses a arguably outdated and inane system called the Electoral College, and how it works is basically this. Each state has what are called electors. These are people that are supposed to cast their votes for the President of the United States based on the popular vote in the state they represent. They also have the right to go against that vote, believe it or not. That's not a very good example of how genuine democracy is supposed to work. So it's possible, based on the population of different states, that one can receive more popular votes but lose the winner-take-all electoral votes. And that's exactly what happened to Al Gore in the year 2000. Again, Bush won the state of Florida, even though nationwide Gore had received more votes. Personally, in my opinion, and I think most Americans would agree with this, the system should be changed so that it reflects the will of the people. If most Americans who are legally eligible to vote cast their vote for a candidate and that candidate pulls the majority of the votes, even if it's by one single vote, they should be the victor. This idea of using electors in the year 2016 is arguably insane, it's wrong, it's unethical in my opinion, but you can't expect the parties that, can, that currently control the United States, that would be the two-party system of the Democrats and Republicans, to make any real reforms because I argue and have since the late 1990s that the Democrats and the Republicans are the problem with America. They are gleefully imploding this great country and making it worse. There are only two political parties, if you think about this, folks, that are directly and wholly responsible for the political chaos that the United States is going through. There are no other guilty parties because they're not in power. So while the Democrats and Republicans are guilty on various different issues, depends on the issue, sometimes they're both equally guilty, you can't blame anybody else because there's only two possibilities, Democrats or Republicans. And that's what makes this election especially interesting because it seems that for the first time ever, and again this is based on polls and surveys, that most Americans now, some 48%, are unenthusiastic about the election. They want a third party viable alternative and although they had the possibility of electing one in the name of Bernie Sanders, they didn't do that, even though polls indicate that Sanders, more than any candidate, would do best against Donald Trump. So you have to understand the arguably insane logic of the Democrats. Here, the Democratic National Party essentially rigs the election to favor Hillary Clinton. She does receive more votes than Sanders does, even though if they're so concerned about a Trump presidency, these Clinton voters would have put their selfish interests aside and cast their votes for Sanders since he had the greatest chance, had, because it won't happen now, of defeating Donald Trump. You can't say that you're putting your country first if you're putting your interests first, especially when they differ. 
So this is what makes this election very interesting, because you have record numbers of Americans who are dissatisfied with the two-party system. Understandably, logically, and correctly, they disagree with what the parties are doing. Some 70% of Americans feel that the United States is heading in the wrong direction. That trend has been growing, especially since Barack Obama became president of the United States. And while I'm not blaming him for it, he absolutely is a contributing factor. In fact, when Obama was elected, he was hyped to be the great uniter, quote unquote. And this just has not happened. In fact, America is more of a divided country now than it has been in a long time. It has increasingly become divided the longer he has been president and the longer that both of these parties have continued to fell the American people. Now, why are we talking about all of this stuff? We're talking about it because we're going to be having on the CalCorf TV show in a couple of weeks, an individual who will give us some very insightful analysis of the election. He will be flagging specific issues and he worked for the Sanders campaign. I am also going on record as saying, and I've never hidden this, even though I'm a journalist and I write for uh, Daily World newspaper and do commentary on Daily World TV, I also back Bernie Sanders, but of course he's not the nominee Hillary Clinton is. For the record, I don't support Hillary Clinton and I don't support Donald Trump. I have said since the late 1990s that these two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, are the problem and that America needs a viable third party alternative. Somebody who will make the hard decisions decline the millions of dollars that lobbyists and special interests give them, and they will make the tough decisions that must be made for the benefit of the American people, which automatically means the nation as a whole. Until such an individual gets elected into the White House and can actually make a real difference and get stuff done in Congress and the Senate, America will continue to implode, and while other nations continue to rise, America continues to decline, you take this reality combined with the shift in the balance of power in the world, the rise of Asia, and you will see that over the next few years, the United States will drop from being number one to number three. It will be a contest for number one and two between communist China and a rising India. India, of course, being the largest democracy in the world. So what we're going to do in this episode of the Cal Corf TV show is we're going to talk about the U.S. election. We're going to lay the foundation and spell out many of the issues. And then in a couple of weeks, when we have a very special, insightful guest, we will be able to build on this foundation laid down in this episode so that the whole picture makes a lot more sense to you, especially if you're not in the United States and you're not American and you're trying to watch this circus that we have going on in the United States to try to understand what's going on in the U.S. presidential election. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Cal Corf TV show. My name is Cal Corf and I'm your host. Folks, what makes this 2016 presidential election extremely unique, especially compared to the previous ones, in fact, there's never been one like this in the history of the United States, is that for the first time you have a real outsider running for president representing one of the two parties that is involved. Now in this case we're talking about the Republicans and their candidate billionaire Donald Trump. Now we have to remember that when Trump ran for president he was dismissed as being a joke. Nobody took him seriously and that was a big mistake. The Republican Party especially underestimated Trump, which was a huge error. You cannot understate the stupidity of that decision. Now what makes Trump's victory and the fact that he clinched the Republican Party nomination, despite incredible odds, is that about two dozen, some, roughly some 24 candidates, were running against Trump. The Republicans pulled out all stops as a party to try to stop Trump, and they failed miserably. The voters not only unanimously rejected all the Republican candidates, 
they blew them off as a joke. A perfect example of this is what happened to the so-called favorite when he finally got off his duff and ran for president. We're talking about former Florida governor Jeb Bush. When Bush finally threw his proverbial cowboy hat into the ring and ran for president, even before he officially declared and finally got busy, and remember he entered the race very late compared to other candidates, he was considered to be a party favorite, the insider. The Republican Party counted their chickens before they hatched. They figured, and many pundits also felt this on both the Republican and the Democrat side, they thought that the contest would end up being between Hillary Clinton, who was of course being backed by her party, versus Jeb Bush. And that didn't happen. Bush never won a single primary. In fact, his support base, how he did in the polls, never rose higher than some 10 to 11 percent. Put another way, he was a complete disaster. There were also times where Bush didn't seem like he really cared that he was in the race. It looked like he was listless, low energy, as the phrase became popular, and was just going through the motions. Voters didn't warm to Bush, and they didn't warm to any other presidential candidate on the Republican side, except, ironically, Donald Trump, who consistently polled about 40% of the votes. Trump won more primaries than any Republican nominee, even though he was a party outsider. The party itself hates Donald Trump. More than 100 prominent Republicans in the government say they're not going to vote for him. That can only help Hillary Clinton, of course. And Trump is a very polarizing figure. Yet Trump, despite all the criticisms, has brought a minimum of 5,000 new voters into the Republican Party. They would not have voted for the Republicans if Trump had not been on the ticket in these primary contests. So Trump went ahead and became what we call a populist. He took issues that people are concerned about, and understandably so, issues that people are emotionally involved with and frustrated over. These include the fact that the economy has been sluggish under Barack Obama, although it improved versus the disaster that George Bush left it in the last year and a half to two years in office. They're upset over Obama and Hillary Clinton's interventionist foreign policy, the disaster in Syria, for example, which the media as a whole has not held Barack Obama accountable for, even though they should, shame on them. They're tired of the fact that Washington is forever locked in gridlock. They don't seem to get much done. These lawmakers take uh, copious amounts of holidays, enjoy perks that uh, the average American will never get to enjoy. And the bottom line is that most Americans feel that the system is now effectively broken. It, the issue of illegal immigration is a hot-button issue on both sides of the border of the United States. In Mexico, it's a hot-button issue, and in the United States, especially in the western and southwestern states, it's especially an issue since most of the illegal immigrants come into the United States through those areas. So what did Trump do? Trump has promised the moon. Will he deliver it? No. In fact, Donald Trump has no experience as a public official. He has never served in public office. He's not a politician. He's an outsider. He's a very wealthy individual. On paper, he's supposedly a multi-billionaire, meaning he, he is worth at least $1 billion. And of course, Trump has a track record of several bankruptcies. And there are plenty of videos floating around on YouTube where he has blatantly screwed over people that he's owed money to. The testimonies of his victims are numerous, and they're out there for the public record and for the American people to see. Yet despite this history, now this does not include his inflammatory rhetoric, his at times off-the-cuff remarks that are just totally wrong when they're not outright lies, 
There's a lot of negative things about Trump, including the policies that he is proposing. And yet today, as we record this broadcast, polls indicate that among voters and those likely to vote in the presidential contest, the race between Trump and Clinton is effectively tied. So how does a blowhard demagogue say all the wrong things, insult many, many people, make arguably racist remarks, advocate policies that won't work, such as building a wall along the entire border of the United States that's shared with Mexico and then making Mexico pay for that wall? How does a person say such things, get away with such behavior, and come within being so close to being the next president of the United States that the race, which is only about six weeks away from ending finally in early November, is effectively tied. How does somebody do that? Well, you do it when you have the electorate that is so frustrated with everything that's going on, they're so desperate for real solutions that they're willing to take their chance on even a Donald Trump-like candidate. And while it's kind of a little insane to do that, that's what's going on. Many voters are voting for Trump because they're angry. Now, is that necessarily the logical thing to do? No. But who said people were logical as a rule? If anything, most people are more emotional than logical, and that's a big problem with many people. If most people let logic rule their emotions, the world would be arguably much better off. Now, we'll take a look at the democratic side of things in just a moment. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Cal Korf TV show. My name is Cal Korf and I'm your host. As we've been talking about folks, we've been discussing the presidential election for 2016 and why it is rather unique or special compared to past elections. Now this is not to take away from past presidential contests, they're all very important of course, but this one has a dynamic that has never been seen before in America's history. Again, the short version is that you have a Republican outsider named Donald Trump who is a real estate mogul and billionaire. He is an individual that has no qualifications to be president of the United States if one defines qualifications as having served the public in the past. Yet here he is effectively tied with Hillary Clinton as of this recording and this broadcast and the presidential race is likely to be determined once the presidential debates begin in the next couple of weeks. Many Americans often stay on the fence regarding who they're going to vote for until they see the debate so it gives them a chance to assess the candidates and how they do against one another. Now one key dynamic in this election is the votes of the independents. They are the swing voters and they will decide this election. Current polls indicate that Donald Trump has some 20-point lead among independent voters. That's actually rather surprising. Now, if the election were held today, there's a very real possibility that Trump would manage to squeeze it out and snatch uh, victory from the jaws of defeat. Hillary Clinton, until the last couple of weeks, was enjoying a razor-thin lead uh, in the contest, but Trump has now effectively tied the race. Now, why has this happened? Well, there's two factors. One is Trump is doing just enough to appear to be credible in many people's eyes, right or wrong, ever since he hired some high-powered uh, social media types from the Breitbart News entity. Trump has overhauled his campaign, and he's made things a little less acerbic than they have and a little less polarizing than they have in the past. However, a key factor that has helped Trump's recent rise has been the continued misbehavior, deceptions, and outright lies by Trump's rival, former Senator and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now let's go over some rather inconvenient truths here. When Hillary Clinton began her campaign, this was effectively when she 
released her book called Hard Choices. Her popularity at that point among American voters was around 70%. They were dream-like numbers. Now, all this time later, a few scandals later, like her email scandal, her untrustworthy factor, or the number where Americans say she's not trustworthy, is around 70%. So the pendulum has not only swung in the other direction, it is diametrically opposite. Now, it takes a lot of special talent to go from being trusted by as much as almost three quarters of the American people to be distrusted by almost the same number. Now, whose fault is it? Is it the byproduct of an alt-right-wing conspiracy or an alt-right conspiracy or even as Hillary Clinton and the Clintons have loved to claim over the years, a vast right-wing conspiracy? The answer is no. The only person to blame for the drop in her numbers and the fact that Donald Trump is now tied with her in the race for President of the United States, it's Hillary Clinton. It's her fault. Now, let's review a few pieces of evidence that essentially prove this. First of all, when the campaign began, Hillary Clinton was viewed as a shoo-in, a certainty. The Democratic Party lined up behind her and actually engaged in an illegal scam that they pulled on the American people, where they basically stacked the deck in her favor. Before the first primary was even held, the Clinton political machine had locked up over 400 superdelegate votes before the first person was able to vote in any of the first primaries or caucuses such as those held in Iowa. Now, can you imagine trying to run against a candidate who already has 400 delegates locked up? You're going to be starting with a huge hurdle. Yet this is exactly the dilemma that Bernie Sanders faced when he jumped in to run for president. Nobody took Sanders seriously, and that was a big mistake. The Clinton camp certainly did not take Sanders seriously, and the Democratic Party itself was aligned against Sanders to the point where they were essentially in the tank for Hillary Clinton. According to reports that have leaked out, and these have been in the news for a long time, a secret deal, which is now public information, was made essentially between the Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Party's chairwoman at that time, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Wasserman Schultz was essentially promised by the Clintons that should Hillary win the big election and occupy the White House, that she would be awarded with a seat on her cabinet likely to be awarded or given to her to be the Secretary of Education. Now, whether this is literally true or not, we can't prove it because we don't have the contract or whatever agreement they signed or may not have signed. No one was in the room when this deal was made. But there's enough circumstantial evidence and leaks to give credibility to this report. And what did Wasserman Schultz do? While publicly she declared that she was neutral and that the party was neutral, the reality was far different. By the time the email system and some computers were hacked, most likely by the Russians, of the Democratic National Party, we now know that indeed the party itself had double-crossed the American people, had double-crossed their own party members, and it stacked the deck in favor of Hillary Clinton winning all the marbles. That is not only wrong, it's election fraud. The scandal was so outrageous, although it was predictable, if you really know the true nature of the Democrats, and especially Debbie Wasserman Schultz, that Debbie Wasserman Schultz resigned in disgrace. And then what happened within some three hours after she turned in her resignation? Surprise! Hillary Clinton then took her on board as a co-chairwoman advisor for her campaign. Now that's about as bad as seeing somebody you know who's the head of a party rob a bank, get caught by the police, busted, 
resigns or goes to prison over it, and then you hire that person immediately because you say you're transparent, you're honest, you're not corrupt, and you're going to fly straight. Sorry, Hillary Clinton, you can't have it both ways. Then there's the issue of Hillary Clinton's email scandal, which is even older than the hacking of the Democratic Party's computers, where the truth was found out about how the Democrats really operate and some of the political intrigues that they engaged in. Hillary Clinton stood before the United Nations at a press conference and said that she sent no classified emails on her system. She said that she used only one mobile device and she wanted to use a private email server because it was more convenient, quote unquote. Well, boo-hoo for Hillary. Why don't you get off your ass and do your job and work a little? Well, we now know that Hillary Clinton used well over a dozen different devices. There were several mobile phones, some of which were destroyed by Hammer. We know that she used a private email server to effectively skirt around Freedom of Information Act requests. And contrary to the lie that she said to the world when she held that press conference, she did not turn over all the emails that were relevant. She, in fact, left almost 20,000 of them out of the hands of the State Department. Hillary Clinton has lied about her email scandal in so many areas that you can actually read online now. You can download your own copies. A report by the Inspector General of the Secretary of State Department, or State Department, and find out where she broke the laws and was reckless and careless where concerned the proper handling of classified information. And you can see how she just didn't tell the truth. She said, for example, that she had approval to use a private email server. The Inspector General's report proves that this was never true. It also proves that Hillary seems never to have asked. And had she bothered to do so, that is, ask for permission, it would never have been granted. This is all in the Inspector General's report. And yet Hillary has a, the nerve to say that this is all speculation. No, it's not speculation. It's fact, folks. Then there was the FBI's investigation of her questionable claims. Conveniently, Hillary said she just couldn't remember certain details more than 20 times. She blamed her concussion for the mental lapse. Well, if her memory is so bad, then she's not qualified to be a president of the United States. You can't have it both ways. And once again, the FBI proved that Hillary Clinton lied. The FBI found some 14,900 emails that Hillary's lawyers and Hillary herself just couldn't be bothered to turn over to the State Department as required by law. When she said, trust me, my lawyers and I went through everything and I'm confident that everything that was relevant was turned over, turns out that wasn't true. And what was in some of these emails that the FBI discovered because they were doing an investigation because Hillary did not tell the truth, was that there were a lot of political favors done. If you donated money to the Clinton Foundation, you got access to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. It was that simple. An analysis by the Associated Press not only proved this, we now know that the Clinton Foundation itself, which has been the subject of an FBI investigation that is still ongoing, isn't the charity that they claim it is. News broke just two days ago that only 5.7%, I'm going to repeat that, that only 5.7% of all the money that the Clinton Foundation brings in actually went to charity. The rest of it went for salaries and miscellaneous expenses, quote unquote, and that includes paying Clinton surrogates and henchmen like uh, Sidney Blumenthal to be her spy and put out feelers there with foreign governments and do Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton's dirty business. We know this because Blumenthal's emails were hacked by a Romanian hacker named Guccifer 1.0. That was the online name he used. This man is now serving a prison time for hacking into emails. The latest emails that have been hacked and leaked come courtesy of an entity that calls himself Guccifer 2.0. It is likely Russian intelligence behind this, 
It is no secret that Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, does not like Hillary Clinton. She doesn't like him either. And it's no secret that both communist China and Russia, as well as American enemies in general, would rather prefer Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States because they think things will be easier for them to play games on the international stage and uh, get away with intrigues. They think it'll be easier Trump is president versus Hillary Clinton. Unlike Hillary, Trump is not an interventionist. Hillary, because she was Secretary of State during Obama's first term as president, you can see what her foreign policy thinking is like. You can thank Hillary and Obama for the fact that the war in Syria has gone the way it has. The United States shouldn't even be involved in that conflict, but it decided when Obama became president and Hillary Clinton became a Secretary of State, they decided to engage in a secret operation that included cooperation with the Saudis and the Turks and Kuwait and Egypt to try to oust Syria's brutal dictator, Bashar Assad. The reason they did this was threefold. One was to go ahead and cut off Iran's influence in the reason because Iran is and has been very active in trying to uh, increase its regional hegemony to become the superpower in the Middle East next to Israel. And then of course you have America's so-called buddies, the Saudis, who are equally radical and the Wahhabi doctrine of Islam, radical Islam, is based on hatred and extremism. That's why Osama bin Laden and some other infamous terrorists are all Wahhabis. Not coincidentally, of course. It's why most of the hijackers who hijacked the four airplanes on September 11, 2001, they were also Wahhabis. So here you have a very dirty game going on where Obama, who criticized George Bush for being an interventionist, Obama then plays the intervention game in Syria, but it backfires. He had no viable replacement for Bashar Assad. He wanted to clip Iran's wings and soften them up in the negotiations and the run-up to the nuclear agreement. He also wanted to stop Russian influence in the region. And he didn't really care about the fact that if this thing didn't work out and that there was no post-war planning since Obama did not have any credible political figure lined up to replace Assad, he didn't really care what it would do to that country. The consequence has been disastrous. Hundreds of thousands of people have been murdered. Half the population of Syria, more than half actually, has been displaced. And while Obama has put pressure on small countries like Germany to bring in one to two million war refugees, many of whom are from Syria, Obama himself only brings in tens of thousands of them into the United States, even though it has been the United States more than any other country that has destabilized Syria, independent of any actions that the terrorist group, the Islamic State, has done. Syria is a very complicated mess. Obama had no right to intervene in it, neither did then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. But that's the way Hillary Clinton is. She's an interventionist. And while she can talk about all of her experience, accomplishments, and expertise, look at what they brought in the world. Trouble. In fact, Trump has a very valid point that her attitude is part of the problem and it has to be stopped. Can you imagine what she, she will be like if she becomes president of the United States? Well, many Americans now are beginning to shudder at that thought just like many Americans are beginning to shudder at the thought of Donald Trump becoming president. So where does this leave everything? The bottom line is that the presidential contest for 2016 is a huge mess. Neither candidate, unfortunately, is going to make the hard decisions that must be made to solve America's problems. Hillary Clinton is a creature of Wall Street and big business. She will not bite the hand that feeds her millions of dollars a year via her foundation or any other way she can worm money into her bank account. Donald Trump, his published policies and what he says he's going to do have been analyzed by numerous economists and the majority of them are of the unanimous opinion that his policies are basically another sop to big business, big corporations, and that they will not solve America's problems. 
So when you have two candidates that are running for president that will not make the right decisions to do the right things, to make the hard decisions that are necessary to restore America and fix its ever-growing problems, what kind of outcome is this election going to produce? Well, the short answer, the blunt answer, the truthful answer, and the only answer that a reasonable, sane person can reach is that this is going to be a disaster. To use very blunt language, the United States is screwed now. It's only a question of by whom and to what degree and over what issues. That is going to be the outcome of this election for President of the United States in 2016. We will be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of the CalCorf TV show where we will have a very special guest who will give us some incredible insight into the election and its minutia, as well as share his experiences of having worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign. My name is Cal Korf. I'm your host. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.